Right, well, it's time for the main feature of the evening. Um, and as I said at the beginning when, uh, when we started off, that standard of our first speaker is really a testament to the fact that we're getting off on the right foot. Uh, and the person I'm about to introduce you to is, was the lead guitarist with uh, Janet Speaks French. Uh, it's probably what he's best known for. <laughs> uh, he's an angel investor. He's invested, he was the founder of uh, SOS Ventures that has invested in so many really, really big companies that we are so familiar with and use every day. Things like Netflix, Harmonix, uh, that developed the technology that ended up being Band Hero and Guitar Hero. Um, and all, much else besides. He now runs his own company out of Cork called Avego, a social rights sharing service. And he's been involved with a load of different tech startups since he left college in, uh, in the 80s. So I'd like to all, you all to put a good, your hands together for our first guest to start up around Ireland, Mr. Sean Russell. All right, so how are things? Good, good. <laughs> wow, look at this crowd. <laughs> it's a great little format, isn't it? Thanks to the Wire guys yeah. for this fabulous space. Yes. And the free, free, free. So, um, I generally like to start these uh, talks off by asking you. This is the first one you've ever done. So, you've done <laughs> <laughs> so whatever done, you do, I've done, one, the I've, general. Done, I've done one interview before, so okay, I'm very, very qualified. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. So, uh, generally, what I like to do is uh, ask you if you um, let's go back to college days. Okay. Yeah. So you started in uh, in New York State, and you went to college, and you did an MSc in science. Um, no, I did a uh, I did a uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering. Okay. And I was not uh, a, the, a guitarist in the rock band. I do play the guitar a little bit, but I was not. I was play piano. Well, we've got a guitar same. hero uh, here this evening, so we're going very to see good. if you're any good at guitar hero uh, at the well, end of the night. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Put me on it. I'm sure there are much better players here than I am. But uh, so, but yeah, no, I started uh, as an engineer. I uh, started programming uh, like. Uh, like many of us in the room, I'm sure, uh, at an early age, I uh, started programming about 12 or so, uh, and, uh, and got really into it by the time I was, say, 14. I was pro uh, working professionally as a programmer since the age of 14, and then went to college at uh, you know, 16 or 17, uh, and then uh, started a company out of, uh, after I graduated college. I worked for IBM for uh, in Boca Raton, Florida, and in Research Triangle Park while I was still going to college. And, uh, and so I had a little bit of experience to some commercial uh, applications as well as working for government, uh, you know, before I uh, graduated college. But I mean, like, like most engineers who are really, you know, good by the time you're in your college age, you, you, you've, you've had some experience be before, so like, you know, it's one of the great things about uh, Coder Dojo, uh, which is one of the programs that we're behind here in Ireland, is it's helping people start earlier so that they know that uh, whether or not they really want to do programming and want to go into science and math by the time they go to college, rather than sort of getting whatever the leaving cert get, get, get gives you and then deciding, oh, I'll try computer programming after never having done any computer programming. So, but anyway, so I started early. Started in, co in college, uh, I, I had some experience working commercially. Decided I didn't want to work for a big company uh, by the time I graduated college, and, and I started my, my own right right out uh, of the gate. Okay, and that was Map Info, was it? That was Map Info. Okay. So the bright idea back then was taking street maps and putting them on uh, computers, uh, which had not been done on personal computers at that time. It was 1985. Uh, and we uh, created that technology. Has anyone ever, has anyone ever done this? You type an address into a computer and you see a street map. Has anyone ever done that in the room? <laughs> more than one, more than one. So we were the guys that invented that and, uh, and that became a very popular uh, you know, idea in a very popular country, uh, company, who had a couple thousand employees, a couple hundred million in revenues. So it was a great start. Uh, I was there for the first, uh, seven years as the president and chairman of it with three co-founders from college, two, uh, two computer programming guys and another electrical electric engineer. Um, and uh, we, we built that uh, you know, company up, it went public 
and uh, I went on to do uh, to do other things. Okay. So um, I was actually doing some uh, some research on you the last day, and I mean you've had such a diverse kind of um, I suppose range of experiences through life. You know, you were a, you were in a rock band at one point. Yes. You were a documentary filmmaker in Iraq during the war. At one yes, point. that's right. Yeah. Uh, and you founded your own tech company. So there's a real diverse. Maybe what you can find out on Google. Is <laughs> <laughs> Don't let anyone put any, you know. I always go by an alias. I should not tell my brother. Try and stay away from Wikipedia. Mm. Mm. But, um, anyway, so yeah, like tell us about you know Map Info. Um, like, what was your first scene path before the point that you found at Map Info? Because surely you had experienced programming, you had experienced music before you went to college, and you you know you had all these different forces and influences in your life. What kind of made you gravitate towards more bu more to business at the start, more so? Well, you know, having worked as a programmer uh, for a big company um, for a little while, I mean, it was still while I was going to college, but uh, I, I, so I worked for IBM in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and that was sort of the pivotal moment for me. I saw a, 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 a really, really the coolest group of engineers that was working at IBM in Research Triangle Park, and there, there was 10,000 engineers working there was doing this like video conferencing uh, phone system. This is back early 80s. And then what happened, and, and it worked, and it was wicked cool, and it was you know, really you know, big um, impact uh, technology. And, was, and, and the, the engineers working on it were pulling all kinds of hours. And then IBM bought a company called Rome Systems, and they canceled the project. And these guys, these eight engineers who had done some kick-ass work, were just, you know, um, hey, sorry guys, the last seven years of your life are, are now out the window. Uh, sorry about that. So I said, you know what, I don't really, I don't really love the vagaries of that. I'd rather you know, be a little bit more in control of my own destiny. If I'm going to pour my heart and soul into something, I want it to you know, be my mistakes <laughs> that cause it to crash and burn, rather than some corporate decision that's made uh, out, of, out, of my, uh, out of my control. So that's what the, you know, the, one of the benefits of, of doing startups. Of course, there's lots of reasons you don't want to do startups, uh, but uh, you know, because of the difficulties uh, and the soul-destroying nature of startups uh, uh, as, it, as it can, can happen. But, but for, for the impetus for me was uh, trying to, you know, every engineer, you put so much work and passion into creating a design that is gonna, that's gonna be used by people and, and, and that's, the, that's the purpose is to have everyday people use your products that you've designed and have millions of people hopefully using the technologies that you, you create have that kind of impact on the world but uh, so, so that's the pride that we get as engineers in creating new things and, and having, having, them, having them just be practical but you know you don't have the impact in a bigger organization to do that. That's why, of course, startups are, are so appealing to so many of us uh, in the room. Are there anybody, is there anybody here in a startup? <laughs> it's about uh, half or so, <laughs> at least. So it's, you know, and uh, yeah, there's all kinds of different startups. There's 50 person startups, there's 100 person startups, there, you know, and, you know, there's all kinds of phases of it. But that's why I got started, uh, and uh, that was the impetus to do it. We started uh, with friends and family money. We, we you know, uh, took credit card loans out. Um, uh, you know, because we graduated. You know, you graduate college in the U.S. at a decent university, and they'll send you these credit card applications. So we filled out every single credit card application, <laughs> and then ran up the credit limit, and just uh, used that to fund the fund the business. So, um, and then you know, I was from an Irish Catholic family in the United States. So uh, good old Irish Catholic families, I had eight brothers and sisters, and each and every one of them uh, put, put some money uh, into the company. And my sister, Rez, put in $5,000, uh, which is a lot, which, but it was good for her in the end because it turned into over a million dollars uh, for her uh, you know, several years later. So it was a life-changing event. For me, uh, but it was also hopeful. It, we, we helped a lot of uh, investors out. That's the kind of thing you want to do. You don't want to screw your early investors. You want to make sure that they're making money hand over fist. You know, you just have a small little piece of the 
I mean, they, they may have a s small little piece of the pie, but you know, you want to make that p uh, pie as big as you can, and uh, and and have everybody make money, whoever invests in you. Okay. I mean, looking at you know your track record, you started Map Info in 1986, am I right? Yeah. Okay, and then in, it floated sometime in the 90s. 93 or 92 or something. Yeah. So after that point where it floated, you could have continued with the company, built the revenues and built growth and so on and so forth. But you decided to go elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, what is it you did and tell us about that and why you actually chose to take that other direction? So I think the next thing I did, you know, with all the money that I earned, all those drug uh, infested and dr drunken years after I, I'd gone public. Let's see, what do they do? No. <laughs> there's, a, there's a 10 year gap in my uh, memory. <laughs> no, uh, actually, actually, I. find that on Google. <laughs> <laughs> there's some, but thankfully, Facebook didn't uh, exist, or there'd be some pretty bad pictures. Uh, but, uh, no, but actually, so I, I went and I uh, started a, a, a rock band, Janet Speaks French, mm -hmm. and we put out a couple of albums. And uh, you know, I was just sort of, uh, you know, punting around with it. But we, it was it was great. We got on uh, top forty on about eighty radio stations, mm -hmm. and we were, you know, on a couple hundred radio stations, I guess. But that's in the U.S. The U.S. market is so big that it's like a little, you know, it's like a speck of dust. So we we never made any sort of impact, and it wasn't a was that just something that you always really wanted to do and was on your bucket list and when you had all these resources to oh, do yeah, it? Oh, yeah, 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 no. Well, it wasn't about the resources, because actually, at the time I started it, it was before the company went public. Okay. So I was still a starving artist at the moment. Uh, and uh, then the company went public just a, a year or two later. But, uh, but uh, no, it's just something, you know, you want to... Like, I, I felt like, actually, one of the things that had happened. Is there anyone here that works for Microsoft? A couple. Sorry about that. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sorry about it because I but, but, but what had happened is that Microsoft had, in the early 90s, it's a very different world now, so it's not the same uh, force that it was, but they had sort of stifled all the innovation and they'd taken over everything. And it was sort of a boring time to be in the software industry in the early 90s, before the internet came in in the mid 90s and sort of opened it all up again. So, you know, they, they basically used monopoly power, you know, at the time they had all that monopoly power and they used it to sort of stifle all the other uh, you know, competitors in the market. You were probably working for Microsoft back at the time, so you don't have anything uh, to, to uh, blame. Uh, we can't blame you individually, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, so it just, it just became sort of a, a, a bit of a, a, you know, less of an exciting time. It didn't feel like you could do as much of a, of a grab uh, and really changed the world quite as much. The company was still growing and doing very well, and it went on to grow even more. But you know, I just sort of uh, okay. felt it was time to do something different. And that brings me on, I suppose, naturally to the next question that I should have mentioned in my introduction. But you were the co-coiner, if you like, um, repeatedly of the term cloud computing. That's right. Yes. Okay. So yes. I mean, obviously, this is a time of innovation. This is a time of loads of scope for yep. how technology can affect us. Yep. Um, how did you, tell us about how you came around to be the cool corner of that uh, particular phrase. So, uh, you know, so everyone was using it, the, the, those days uh, the internet was dial-up networks and things like that and, you know, it was getting a little bit, going a little bit more rapidly. I was still in a rock band. My brother, uh, who was in the t tech uh, field, you know, called me and said, you gotta, you gotta see this internet thing. And so I, I, uh, you know, I got up, hooked up to a high-speed connection, and uh, you know, you know, rather than a dial-up line, because everyone before, before, you know, that everyone had experienced online services like AOL and CompuServe, but the the, the World Wide Web, which was, you know, most people were then uh, using Mozilla to access the the, the World Wide Web, uh, which was the predecessor to Netscape, and so that's when I saw it before actually Netscape had even incorporated. So it was really early days. And the, the, the reason that people were using the web was basically for email, for network connectivity, and, and things like that. They weren't really doing anything uh, advanced uh, in, that, in that day. So, you know, when you, it was just a logical, uh, you know, a logical extension of the idea of like local area network computing where you took 
all the services that you would normally. But, so the personal computer came along and you did all the services uh, that you would do, whether it's printing or you know, faxing or you know, whatever you hook up to your PC. You do it right there on the spot, hard drives, whatever, the servers. And then the local area network came out and then that was, okay, well, you're just putting your hard drives on some central server and then, you know, and all, all these other services on the local area network, like, you know, print, print servers and fax servers and all these other things. So, so then the, you know, it was kind of obvious that you'd end up with the, the cloud doing the, all the network services that you had previously done on your local computer, but would, all these network services would be done by the cloud. So the only thing that we did was really put the term together. We, we, I created a fairly big startup in, in Boston, it was in Cambridge at the time, and, and we sort of promoted this concept and, and we got a lot of backing and there were you know, dozens of companies that, that uh, started writing to this uh, sort of format, for interchange format that we created to do these network, network services over the internet. So, and that, that's when we talked about uh, cloud computing, and yeah, I mean, we were at the very, very early days of it, and, and uh, the term, the funny thing is I took, I had, okay, this is the funny thing, uh, is I had totally forgotten that I came up with the term cloud computing uh, until MIT Technology Review called me, and they said, hey, um, we are digging around, and uh, we think you're the guy who came up with the term cloud computing. And I, said, and I said, well, that could be, but I totally didn't remember. And I was, I was on my way out to a party, and I, and I said, I'll, I'll get back to you later, or, or whatever. But it, the reason they tracked me down is because I actually had trademarked the name cloud computing back in, in January of, of 1996 or, or, or something. And it was because we had launched the, this uh, as an as a effort with Compact Computer who you'd never heard of back then. I'm sorry, I'm probably boring you guys to, to tears with all this, but this is a little bit of the history of the, of the early days of the internet. So anyway, so, uh, and then, so a couple of days later, you know, it just, you know, I said, yeah, okay, I'll look up some old documents, and yeah, it, it confirmed that, I had to, I'd totally forgotten about it, actually. And other articles in the newspapers, you know, like in the mid-2000s and whatnot, had credited to other people like, uh, you know, um, Jeff Bezos and all these other guys for coming up with the, the, the term, but, uh, but uh, we, we started it first. George Favaloro from Compact Computer and, and, and uh, myself not only came up with the term, but also came up with the concept of concept behind it. Very good. And like, I was actually looking at your portfolio the last day, um, and for SOS Ventures that you founded in 1982, I'm correct? Uh, 1992, yeah. Yeah. Um, how many companies have you invested in? So we're at, we're really accelerating our investing the, these days. So we're investing in about you know thir probably this year we'll probably invest in about 50 companies through through different accelerator companies and, and whatnot. We're probably up until this year we may be investing in 10 to 20 companies. So we have a portfolio of maybe 60 60 companies over. I mean some of the investments go way back. We have the active people, active companies in our portfolio right now are probably like 60, but, but we're starting these accelerator programs just like the Wira uh, thing that you're in tonight um, all over the world. And, uh, and that is, so, so we, have a ch we started the first accelerator program in China called China Accelerator. We started the world's first hardware accelerator program in Shenzhen, China, and S San Francisco called Hackcelerator. And just those two programs by themselves, we're doing 20 companies a year, plus uh, we're then funding the companies that, that we truly believe in uh, on top of that af after that. And then we pick off individual investments as well. So we're, we're very small as it, as, it, you know, as, it, as it relates to like big venture capitalists. We have a, about $180 million uh, fund, which is small when it, you think about the big guys that have billions of dollars under manage, management. But it's because we start really early and then and, and we just stay with the companies. Uh, but it's not that much, uh, it's not that much money compared to, you know, uh, you know, an 
Andreessen Horowitz or Kleiner Perkins or any of those guys. And like in terms of the fund itself, what's your strategy now for the next five years? I mean, what's, what are you thinking as regards trends and what are you thinking about regards what's good to go in there? Yeah. On? So, so, you know, well, big trends, uh, you know, are, are clearly like the connected devices, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, har I, I actually think the time for hardware is re-emerging to really, really interested, interesting hardware devices are in, in putting, you know, smarts into all sorts of different uh, computing experiences. Like, for example, um, does anyone have a MyZeo? Uh, uh, has anyone ever heard of MyZeo? You got one? You got one. So, so uh, I got one. I love it. Uh, I put it on uh, at, at night. It reads my, it, it's an EEG machine. Uh, that that I strapped around my head. It has, can, communicates with wi Wi-Fi to the to the bed stand, which is and it and it's my alarm clock. So uh, and it's like a hundred dollar device, or you know, and and what it does is it wakes me up uh, at the right time in my sleep cycle, so that I wake up refreshed. And, uh, and <laughs> has this ever happened to you? Even if you sleep like eight or nine hours, you know, so some long, hugely long period of time. And you still wake up groggy? Is it, has anyone ever had that experience? Yeah. Like you sleep enough and you're still groggy. This, this actually wakes you up at the right time, so you wake up and you're like, oh. <laughs> 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 wow, <laughs> that's worth $200. <laughs> but, uh, so there you go. Uh, I should get a, a plug or advertising for that. But uh, you know, it's a great device, and uh, and also the thing it, it also helps you improve your sleep patterns. Uh, so you know, I've cut out some things. So now I, you know, you can sort of hack around with your own body, right? So I've now uh, in five hours for a person my age. I'm 48 years old. Uh, for a person my age, I get as much in five hours sleep as the average person seven uh, who sleeps seven and a half or eight hours a, a night. So that's great because I don't have time to sleep. <laughs> so uh, and and it's and and, and they, they, there's a website that sort of helps you you know discover how to sleep better and things like that and tells you how, what percentage of the time you're in REM cycle, light sleep, deep sleep. It's really cool. So, so that's just one one device. There's another device that that we now we didn't fund that one, but that that guy who did that device is a, a mentor on one of our programs, uh, the Hack Accelerator program in China. And uh, there's a device that we did find, which is, I don't know if any of you have seen Leap Motion. Uh, you've seen the Leap? Uh, okay, so Leap is so freaking cool. Like, it's basic, has anyone seen uh, or heard of the Microsoft, uh, which is a great innovation for Microsoft, our friends at Microsoft. <laughs> um, it, it, the Microsoft Connect, uh, which is a yeah. really, really cool sort of motion control device. Well, this Leap thing is like, 10,000 times more accurate and you know in terms of the cost of manufacture it's like 15 or 20 times cheaper to manufacture this device so it's being built into everything and it's it's incredible it's being built into televisions do I need to change the channel I point at it I change the channel I raise the volume up and down or whatever it's going to be built into television starting up for next year and it's just it's built into car it's being built into cars it's being built into laptops it's just an amazing uh, new interface uh, technology. They sold, they, they, there was a viral video that went out and they sold like 70,000 developer units in the first three days, $5 million in orders in the first three days uh, for, this, uh, for this product. It is so transformative. But that's, a, that's an example of something that's a cool hardware software innovation because there's some real new math that's behind that. So do you really, you warn a lot to hardware? Because a lot of these, a lot of PCs at the moment are, are focusing on, on soft offerings. You really like hardware? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like hardware. There's a lot of, in it, in, a lot of pretty cool stuff in hardware. Now that said, you have to be a little bit wary because there's like, we did this. Uh, one of the accelerator companies that graduated a few months ago is this uh, Nomiku uh, system, uh, and they put up something on Kickstarter, and with you know within a few hours or whatever, it was a record fast time, they raised their first hundred thousand dollars and they blew through their Kickstarter goal. And that's great and that company is going to do extremely uh, well. It's a home cooking appliance, it's like the mi microwave of the 21st century. Um, it's, 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 it's cool. But it, it, it cooks things, immersive cooking is it's just cool. 
Um, and so, but, but I have to say, you have to be careful with, with hardware, and you have to be careful with Kickstarter, because Kickstarter is like the vaporware channel of, of, you know, of the current day. Like, you know, back in the 90s, they had something called vaporware, where, has anyone heard of vaporware? Yeah. yeah. So where you have a PowerPoint of what your, your slide and software is going to do, and then you, you sell that, and then, you know, you say, oh, give us the money, and then it'll be ready next in six months. Well, that's what's going on right now with uh, the, in the hardware area. So I'd be a little, I'm cautious about hardware, but I, I think it's a fantastic, uh, there are fantastic opportunities for real genuine innovation um, that's gonna affect us in every part of our lives. We've had, we've had the opportunity for software to, to change our lives and improve productivity for a really long time. And much of, our, much of the things that can be automated on the computer have been automated on the computer. How much more do we need to, you know, automate a, a programming environment? I'm sure the programmers would think that there's a lot more. But, you know, how much more can we automate our lives? You know, whether it's the health of our lives or, or our eating or our, you know, or our, you know, exercise or, or, or anything else. I think there's quite a bit that can be done. So, like, in terms of, like, you've obviously gotten involved with a lot of these accelerators and we know you've been involved in uh, Techstars, which is probably one of the more lead, leading ones, one of the best known at the very least. Yes. Uh, what kind of, like, in, the, in terms of SOS Ventures, what's the nature of the deal with, with something like Techstars? Do you run it in a particular jurisdiction or do you... So, no, the way that, the way that uh, these things are set up, and maybe this is some sort of dirty little secret uh, that uh, I'd be glad to share with everyone, uh, is that the best accelerators generally, um, that may, is not always this, this way, but a lot of the best accelerators are actually funded by multiple parties, like venture capitalists or whatever. Um, so like Techstars, for example, like we're a founding sort of funder of Techstars Boston. So there's 10 different venture capitalists in, in Boston that funded Techstars. And then, so when you have a demo day, you know, not, and not only are the, the people that are investing, they're also mentors for the programs, et cetera. But then when you have a demo day, you know, you have investors in the room that are interested and have been following these companies for a while, and so therefore, they're more likely to take out a checkbook and, and, and pony up. So that's, but it, from the investor's point of view, the cool, cool, cool thing is that you get to see and track a company over three months, and you get to see how well people keep their promises. Because, you know, when it comes to investing in companies, what you really need to, need to develop um, is not faith in somebody's pitch. The pitch is great, and I'm sure, that, I'm sure that there, there were some great pitches tonight, I'm sorry that I missed them. But um, the, uh, you know, the pitch is kind of irrelevant. Because anyone can pitch something in three minutes and, and gloss over what the complications are or whatever. What's relevant is how people deliver over time. You know how companies uh, are consistent with with communication of information and consistent in developing you know the minimum viable product and really really sticking to the knitting, doing whatever it takes to to get their product you know to a stage in just a tiny little window of time. You get a lot of experience working with, with entrepreneurs and they get a tremendous amount of, um, you know, of, of life-changing advice uh, in, a, in an accelerator program. I highly recommend accelerator programs. Okay, so would I be right in saying that with accelerators as opposed to the feeders that actually come to you natively, if you like, do you get a lot of your, do most of your deal flow, flow from accelerators that you're involved directly with? Yeah, I okay. say we do. Okay, and is that generally a preference for you, or is that part of the strategy? It absolutely is. Okay, it's a preference for us, and there's, there's, it's not just us. It's the other people that back our accelerators. They're also getting deal flow from, from, from that as well. You know, and we, the people that we, that you know, so we're, we're, we're getting, we're getting, uh, you know, companies that come into the accelerator. Um, we're, we're looking at them. Uh, you know, how, how well are they going to do? Uh, you know in the whole marketplace, we get to see them over, over, over the months, but so do all the other mentors, and that draws the mentors into to wanting to support them and the other VCs that are, that are backing the, the, the fund. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the fund. I know you've got um, partners set up in the 
US and Asia. And I actually know your European partner, Bill Leo. Yep. I met him on the street last week and he got talking to me about how you invest early stage. And he mentioned that with a lot of the companies that you talk about, or that you invest in at a very micro seed level, you ask them to focus on nothing else but traction. Mm -hmm. And until the point where they actually get to the past the metric that you set for them, you'll invest more. Money. Is that a particular type of investing? That's, a, that's a particular, uh, you know, like um, what, what Bill is trying there is, you know, basically iterative investing or, you know, re, uh, I think he's calling it agile investing. And, you know, the tr traditional way that, that people would have invested in the old venture capital days is, hey, you know, um, you guys have a fantastic, well-proven team. You've got, a, you, know, a, you know, a VP of engineering that's done it in three other companies and, and you know, you've got, uh, you know, a great idea and this and that and the other thing. And so we will we'll fund you, you know, $3 million, you know, Series A round, you know, and, and you know, good, and that'll give you 18 months or two years of runway or, or whatever. That, you know, you know, gets people sort of, uh, it's not, th that way is not the, the lightweight way the, 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 uh, that is the preferred means today. It gets people sort of thinking about the waterfall style of, uh, of development, like, oh, so in 18 months we have to have, you know, such and such, and, you know, rather than the rapid, you know, prototyping agile development that, that we all know works much better than, the, you know, scrum-based development that just week after week getting out, getting a product out and done, putting it into the hands of customers, seeing what they do with it, fixing it, and, and, and uh, doing, and getting traction. Because, you know, the only thing that makes something investable is, is, that, is that traction. And, you know, th that makes something really, really investable at the levels that entrepreneurs expect. Because entrepreneurs have hugely high expectations for what they, it, it is that they've built. Everyone thinks that what I've done, you know, in this room today, we have at least $5 billion worth of ideas. <laughs> right? And every, you know, you add up all these startups in here, there's five, a $5 billion market cap as to what you guys think you're worth. I'll tell you what, if I had $5 billion, it may be a good investment to invest in all of you uh, equally, but only one or two of you is actually gonna give me that $5 billion return, and the other, the other guys are gonna not, not make it. So, um, so, but everyone thinks their idea is worth millions or tens of millions. It's not, it's not. It's execution that makes it worth worth it. And that's what I think Bill is talking about in okay. terms of rec recognizing that this is a team that can get traction. But one of the things that frustrates me on, on Dragon's Den, you know, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on this television show called Dragon's Den. Has anyone seen the TV show? Yeah, never heard, heard of it. Perfect, never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, is you'll get people, entrepreneurs coming up to you and they say, oh, so um, I've got this idea for a website and here's what it looks like. And so, so, and so I'll ask, so uh, which, you know, so which one of the two of you is the technical co-founder, or are you both uh, programmers? And they're saying, oh no, we outsourced it to, uh, you know, India or, or something, or to Poland or whatever. And I'm like, you are trying to run a software business, or, you know, a scale, you know, you're trying to build a, a website that's going to scale, and you don't even have the technical capabilities to deliver it yourselves, you know, to me, there's a fundamental flaw in, in, in understanding about what it takes to build uh, a business. And yet, you, the, the, com the companies will want to value themselves at you know, tens of millions of dollars. So it, to, to, to make a team, uh, it, takes a, you know, it, takes the, it takes the whole team. You need the technical team, you need the marketing team. Sometimes the, the technical people are marketing cap capable, but sometimes they're not. You need the sales capability, and sometimes that's all boiled into at least, you know, it's, it's usually boiled into two or three different people. Okay. And like, I suppose in terms of our own fund and, and looking at investments and so on, a lot of the, like, it's very hard to arrive at evaluation at any stage, sure. at any other stage. And what are the cornerstones that you like to rely on to try when you're trying to arrive at evaluation at a very young, early stage? At a very early stage? Like, you know, Show me what you've done, you know. Show me the working prototype. You know, certainly, you you know you've been able to if you've got the, you know if you've got the skills to do do a website, you surely you've got a, a working prototype. Show me show me it, 
um, let me see what it looks like. Does it look really cool? You know, don't come to me saying, oh, we need 50 grand to outsource to have the website developed by some people and um, trust me, it'll be great. Uh, show me what you've done with nothing to get, you know, you, you know, creating something from nothing is the most challenging part of what an entrepreneur does, you know, and that's what we do all the time. And that's what actually builds the value, right? So, uh, so show me that you can build something from nothing. It's like that, uh, you know, that game where, you know, you're, you're trading, uh, you know, you trade a rock and then you get a, you know, you get a book and you trade the book for, uh, you know, encyclopedia and then you get a house at the end of it. You know? uh, that's, what, that's what an entrepreneur is doing. They're always leveraging. And basically what you're doing is you're leveraging your own capabilities to be worth something, you know, from nothing. Okay. I mean, I suppose then that, that kind of lead me into what we want to, I want to talk about some of your clients and some of your portfolio companies. And I mean, there have been many and there have been some really, really notable ones. So tell me about, I, I, the one I'm particularly interested in is Harmonics because I read about these guys a few weeks ago. And um, who's, who's this? Harmonics. Harmonics, yeah. yeah. They're great. And uh, I, like really they spent the best part of 10, 12 years developing technology that never really succeeded. And they tried three or four times to bring something to the market that didn't really sell. Then all of a sudden, they come up with something that turned yeah. into guitar hero. So yeah, so like they always had cool, cool stuff. I was working in Cambridge at the time. They were out of the MIT Media Lab. Uh, they were, um, you know, it was a great bunch of guys, very enthusiastic, totally knew what they were doing, um, wildly, you know, passionate about music and about allowing people to create music. And you know what I, so I love the I love the group of entrepreneurs in terms of what they could do and what they had uh, in and of themselves. But, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't ready for, for market that I believe, I believed in, a lot of other people did. I, I was one of uh, many other, many other people that backed them in the early days. So you were in the early, really early stage there, right? Yeah, like, you know, within the first, you know, year, uh, uh, you know, before they had any sort of commercial uh, sales or anything like that. And I heard at one point like that, they raised so many rounds to get to the point where they could produce Guitar Hero that they left very little equity for themselves. No, actually, they've done extremely well. <laughs> no, I disagree. No, they've, they've done extraordinarily well. They're very rich. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, but, no, no, they did, they did great. Um, so, uh, but, you know, they, they didn't, uh, what, they, what they did is they, 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 uh, they never, ra they, they kept, raising a few rounds, they, they didn't quite, you know, have a breakthrough, but they were always working, they always had some interest, they always had some bands that would, would, would be working with them, they, they always had some buzz going on, there was always, and they were always passionate about it. It did take them 10 years, and they did not make any money for 10 years, and they were still at it, and they never gave up, and they were relentless about it, and that is exactly what it takes to, 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 to be an entrepreneur, to just never give up, to know that you're vision and direction, it is the right one. It's a hard path, you know, you have to be scaled at the right size. You can't, you know, prematurely scale because you'll run out of money, you'll run out of, you know, you'll run out of enthusiasm. But these guys kept at it. And then, you know, suddenly they were the number one game in the world. And suddenly they were selling a billion dollars worth of products, uh, you know, a year or two billion dollars worth of products. And suddenly, you know, they were, you know, individually, you know, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and we made up very well with, with it as well. Um, tell us about uh, Netflix. It's a really interesting one we came to Ireland recently. Netflix, Netflix, I originally got into as a, as a I'm, you know, I'm a, I was a limited partner in another VC uh, fund that I was an original investor in another VC fund. So that's how I originally got into Netflix. Um, and and so I just, I just kept following Netflix and I stayed with Netflix and then I just bought more and more and more of it. That's actually one of the things I did with Harmonix too. It wasn't, you know, it was actually some of the best return I actually had. I bought like eight or nine years into Harmonix when other investors were getting tired. I bought the other investors out, uh, some of the other investors out. And then like two years later, it was selling for, you know, a hundred times what they sold it uh, to, to me for. So you know, it's about having that patience and persistence uh, in, in in things. 
with Netflix, you know, they, they came out, they, they even came out, they went public very quickly because, you know, uh, probably they were loss making, et cetera. But, you know, they also died. They were available in the public market. I kept buying them. I just, you know, I had the initial shares that I had through the, you know, through the venture capital rounds. Yeah. But I just kept, kept buying them even when they were public. And then they, they, they you know, then they did do a huge run up over, over the years. So. And did you have any influence when Netflix uh, migrated to online? No. Um, I, I, you know, I've just been a fan. I mean, it's not, the investing is easy, right? You know, you just put money in things that are going to go someplace and you wait. <laughs> How hard is that? Yeah. Jesus, you know, that's easy. Um, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't on the board. I mean, I would meet with the guys uh, occasionally, but I wasn't on the board of Netflix. I was doing, doing uh, I think I was probably in Iraq when they, they, they had the, the biggest uh, sort of run, run of it. Okay. So, uh, but you know, I investing is not, you know, it's not, uh, it's just, you know, having patience. And, and supporting people and then helping make some introductions and doing every doing that kind of thing. It all comes down to the team. You know, it all comes down to the, the internal team that is building that company. The back, the guys you're backing, they need to be able to do it by themselves. And they shouldn't be looking to you to do it for them. You know, you can help them, but the, it's it's the it's the uh, you know it's the entrepreneur that makes the makes the company. It's not the investor. The investor is along for the ride. So let's go back just quickly. I'm going to move on actually to um, some more European companies, but let's go back to dot com time um, and the fallout of all that. And basically, that those intermittent years between dot com busts and the rise of cloud and everything that has become uh, the point that we're in at the moment. At what point did you know that we were on something new post dot com? When did you know that this whole innovation thing that's happening at the moment? What was the time that made you wake up and think it's the time to start investing in startups again? Well, actually, the funny thing is, in 1996, I wrote a big document about cloud computing, and it was my business plan for the company, NetCentric. And that company, by the way, was a bomb. It totally, it ended up totally blowing up. So, one of the things that is true about uh, about entrepreneurs, and I'm mostly an entrepreneur, I'm also an investor, but is that you know, if you're going to you know go for the home runs, you're also going to be striking out a lot. So you know, really, you know, you have to, you know, you have to be patient with yourself, and you have to not want to commit suicide uh, when you fail. You know, because you will fail, and you will have to get back up and get, you know, keep going and say, yeah, I, I screwed up again, but I learned something from it, and I'm going to. I'm going to keep going. So, you know, in that case, I lost millions of dollars uh, on, on that company, my own money, uh, that I backed. And worse yet, I lost millions of dollars for a bunch of investors uh, that uh, had trusted uh, in me uh, and had invested in the company that I'd started. And I felt very, very badly about that. It was a dark, you know, it was a dark moment for me. So, um, and, uh, you know, you have to, you know, a lot of times you'll have, I mean, a, a real entrepreneur feels, a, 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 I, I think, a debt of responsibility to be honest with their investors, to be truthful, and to, to try to get their money back, no matter what, and see it through to get, their, to get their money back. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way, and it's a pretty, pretty hard road when, when you do that. But so NetCentric, we, we built that up, it had eight or 10 million in sales, but it had like 12 million in expenses, the dot-com crash came and all the money dried up and it was not, it was not being run. Okay, well. we're, we're kind of coming around the circle now to you coming to Ireland, becoming the celebrity that you've become in Ireland uh, and um, coming on to Dragon Stand. Was there any particular reason? What made you really want to do Dragon Stand in Ireland? Does anybody know the answer to this question? Yeah. Yeah. This, this. That's right, because there is a really tight supply of programmers in, in Ireland. It's re really hard. Uh, and it's true, it's not just in Ireland, it's Sil Silicon Valley has 100,000 uh, job openings they can't fill from the programmers as well. But it's hard in, in Ireland to get really, really top, top quality engineers. So the only reason I joined Dragon's Den was to get Avego uh, to be more well known. 
and uh, so that we could get the top quality engineers that we that we need to grow our business. We have, you know, and have had enough orders for our products to grow at a much faster pace than we've been able to grow. It's just we lack the the, the technical uh, pool. Um, that we got great people. We got fantastic developers in our company, but we just don't have enough of them. And Ireland has that issue. I mean, every you know, it's not just Ireland. It's, it's Silicon Valley. That's what Open Ireland is about, uh, and uh, that's what uh, this tech visa is that we're trying to get rolling. And actually, the government uh, is seeming to definitely want to jump on board with that. Has anyone heard of Open Ireland? A couple. Great. Thank you very much. Sign up and support the petition. Show your picture. Tell you, tell us your story as to why you think it's important for Ireland, because the message is getting out there and it's being understood. It's it's a point of shame actually for me that I had that and if, for any company to say we can't get we can't get the talent. Why why can't we get the talent? I looked around and it wasn't just me. It was every other technology company that had these openings that they couldn't fill. And, and all the sort of cannibalism that's going on, people poaching people from one company to another company and, and, and all that. And uh, you know, so if the tech industry is going to thrive, it's going to require a greater supply of, of engineers. And that's why we did Coda Dojo. That's why I'm helping with Khan Academy to try to educate people at the secondary level in Ireland. And it's also why I, I hope in Ireland exists to try to flow, free up a flow of, of, of uh, technical talent into Ireland and have Ireland become the first country in the English-speaking world where if you're the world's, amongst the world's best and brightest engineers, it's a free pass. You can come to Ireland. That's really hard. No other country in the world can claim that. They close the borders and we need to open the borders to that kind of uh, talent. Does anyone agree with this? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Running slightly over time, so um, I just wanted to open the floor to some questions for about five ten minutes. Sure, we're going to take we're going to take four questions, okay? So I'm going to take this gentleman over here. Um, you can just uh, say. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the hardware. You mentioned that hardware is getting sexy again. What do you think about PCH? PCH, Liam Casey, he's a great guy. I, I uh, hung out with him in Shenzhen for many hours. He's a wonderful guy. He's doing gangbuster business. He's making some of the world's coolest electronics products. Um, he just went to Shenzhen, you know, 10 or 12 years ago and just set up shop and has done a, a marvelous job in building a multi-billion dollar business. And he had the idea sitting on a boat in Kinsale Harbor, which is actually where I live in, I live in Kinsale. So, um, and you know, this, this, it's great. You know, PCH is what PCH is doing is great. They're trying to they're trying to beat the supply chain for some of the bigger uh, companies. They're also trying to do it for smaller companies. And we'd love to work more with PCH. We, uh, you know, we like PCH. You know, Liam's doing a great job. Okay. Uh, next question. Yourself. Hello. Um, I just want to ask you. Obviously, see so many funding applications com coming through here in Ireland. Is what do we do very well? Uh, in the startup arena, and perhaps what are the things that we really can improve on when we're making those submissions? Yeah, so like Ireland is full of people with enthusiasm, ideas, and the capability to sell. You know, Ireland has a unique, uh, you know, whether, whether it's gift to the gab or whatever, they can, we can uh, position and sell products well. I take pride in my, my uh, heritage here. I, I know I was born in the United States but I'm 93, 92 and a half percent Irish. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, you know, so that, that is a skill that, that we have. And anyone who relocates here uh, gains that skill pretty quickly or else they're, they're out of the pub, man. They're not cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, so uh, I, I think we're great at that, you know. And, uh, you know, it's amazing that all the Irish entrepreneurs that have done so well in other places around the world. I guess where we haven't done well is in scaling the businesses here, you know, uh, and keeping them uh, with, say, the world headquarters here. You know, it'd be cooler if we had a couple more, a couple hundred million dollar Irish companies. But I was just at the opening of uh, Realex, uh, you know, their office center, John Robertson's Key or something. Yeah. Here. Oh, yeah, just it's like next door. Next door. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, earlier today. Uh, 
and with uh, Colin and all, all his management team, they're doing some great stuff. They're going to be a couple hundred million dollar, uh, you know, they're a real player. You know, and, and there's lots of other uh, Irish companies that have been and will, will be uh, real, real great players. Um, but we could, do, we could use more of that. I mean, we, need, we also need more of a, our, you know, you know, why do I care about fixing Ireland's education system? You know, why do I care about getting science, technology, engineering, and math taught at the primary and secondary level? Because that's, gonna, that's what's going to drive, you know, uh, our ability to create these businesses in the long term. So if you look out, I mean, what we're doing with Coder Dojo isn't going to matter for eight years. But you know what? Uh, you know, if we're going to need to scale in eight years, I need to start getting some programmers, uh, you know, developing now. And the best programmers start when they're like 12, 13, 14. You know? Does anyone start? Did anyone start that early here? Does anyone start? There's a couple. And guess, look, you know, look at you. You're, you're, you're entrepreneurs. You know? So that's great. You know, the, the, they're going to, you know, if we, and there's 3,000 kids every weekend between 7 and 17 that are learning at Coder Dojos. Has anyone been to a Coder Dojo? A couple. You know, you should mentor if you, if you haven't. Just go. It's so exciting. It's so cool seeing all these kids doing uh, this, um, this unbelievable stuff. It just turns you on. It's really great. You know, it's really fun. And, you know, so, so we, we need that technical talent flow in Ireland. Uh, so we need the, the top, you know, we've, we've got a huge number of problems in terms of our education system because, you know, at least in the United States, you have enough of a population base that you can be extremely selective and have top quality engineering schools. Um, but in Ireland, unfortunately, the way the Leaving Cert thing is organized, uh, you know, it's like the most competitive engineering program for software engineering in the country is Trinity. And you only have to get like a 350 or something, which is in the top 30% of your high school graduating class in order to get in that. You know, MIT is the top half of 1% or top quarter of 1% of people can get into MIT. You know, the school I went to is the top 2%, you know, to get into. So you really need, in, ter in terms of having, I'm not trying to be elitist here, but you need really, you know, in terms of design engineers, I mean, you, you really need some, the brightest and, and the best. And unfortunately, we're turning those people away from engineering because they're, they're looking at the leaving cert results and they're saying, well, geez, I've got 560 points. I, I, the, my options are to become a dentist, uh, you know, a doctor, or an international business economics uh, major with, you know, German. You know, and that's what people are, you know, I know this is really complicated, you know, but, or you know, may seem arcane, but we need to keep attracting our top talent. To, there should be an MIT of Ireland, you know, where, where the best, uh, of the best can go. And there should be multiple scales of it. Um, and I think that is, that is something we'll get. And Ireland, by the way, had this in the 1990s. There, were, there was a much more competitive engineering uh, thing going on in the 1990s, uh, late 90s and, and early 2000s. So we have to get back to that is one of the th one of things. And then we'll, we'll do even better. But I, I, I say that I'm not, I'm not being really, I know it sounds like I'm being really critical, but we have, you know, 50% of our staff is, is Irish and they're top quality people. It's just that you have to keep sifting, uh, sifting through, you know, for your design engineers. There's a tremendous amount of techno technological jobs that aren't design engineers. Support engineers, you know, you know lots, of, uh, lots of sales, sales roles, you know, all, all sorts of other roles. And, you know, plenty of entrepreneurs aren't, are, are actually sort of the, the guys that, that wouldn't be design engineers. And that, that's all part of the ecosystem. Everyone has their place. But, you know, you ask me what we need to fix, these are, these are areas we need to fix. Okay, we're going to take one last question, actually. Um, if uh, yourself down there, yeah. Uh, I just want to be kind of devil's advocate, because I can't believe in what you're saying. But from the point of view of a software engineer, why should we open our borders? Why shouldn't we lock down our industry the way lawyers and doctors do? Like, mm. If you offered salaries that a doctor, a doctor could make a quarter of a million, you offered starting software engineer roles and that, you'd fill all your jobs. Mm -hmm. So 
so yeah, so the the thinking is, if I follow that line line, line of thinking, then well, people, people always wonder why can't we get enough software engineers? The answer is you don't pay them. Yeah. Well, so so there's if if you follow that line of thinking, then you say okay, everybody everybody should be making a quarter of a million uh, dollars a year. What ends up happening is the consumers don't get very good products because the products are so expensive that nobody can buy them and, and no company can get funded because you can't start. You can't take your credit card loans like I did, you know, take out $5,000 on your credit card account and start a business because, you know, that doesn't pay for, what, a, a week's worth of work at 250 grand a year. Um, there's, the, you know, the way that you build wealth in engineering is by, uh, by creating products and then having those products scale. The service industries, like like law and medicine, can get away with charging a lot, and 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 that's you know all the more power to them. But that doesn't scale the economy, and we can't drive our, our economy that way. Um, I I'd say you know I understand your point, but if you if you do that if you if every software engineer in, in Ireland was at 250 grand a year, then all the multinationals would move out, and how many and how many indigenous com uh, companies would actually? Because that's not competitive with what you could pay in New York or in Chicago or, or, or some other place, so or or China or anywhere. Uh, so so you know once the multinationals move out, how many of the indigenous companies could afford that? We have to have an economy for our whole country, not just, not just for the, 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 the top people. So I understand, uh, you know, I understand the point that if we lock our borders down, it's kind of the union argument. This is what the car industry did, right? So they said, all of the us guys who are car mechanics, we need, or, you know, car, car assembly people, we're gonna make 100,000 a year Plus, if you lay us off, or it'll be two years severance pay, so it's another 200000 you can't lay us off. And the car companies went along with that, until they went out of business. So, you know, we can, you know, we can do that through ourselves, but I think the opportunity here for Ireland is to try to create a thriving community, which is competitive, which, which is going to uh, be more of a hub rather than an outpost. Because what we can, we, we can either be an outpost where we're, you know, we're, we're a sales and service entity to other people's software companies, or we can be a hub where we're attracting, where we, where we become a mecca, uh, and, and we're drawing people in, and we get a very, very healthy ecosystem. You know, I, right now, I think we are starved for, for technical talent, um, and, I, and I think that makes it very competitive for, for companies to, to grow. So I, I, you know, I understand your point, but I think if you if we did that, then we would die. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> does anybody does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have one more question, and we're going to take it, uh, and after that we'll roll up. That's all right, Sean. Sure. Um, sorry. I'll, 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 I'll sure. try to be less long-winded. <laughs> Here's, here's the thing about Ireland. So we have a population of four and a half million, but we're trying to produce products for a world that's, what, seven and a half billion or something? So like more than a thousand times as big. It would be unrealistic to think that if we're going to be a hub of technology, that we would have all of the time. Just to give you an example, San Jose. 40% um, of the people that live in San Jose were not born in San Jose. They were not, which is a population, say, of the population of Ireland. They were not even born in California. 
They were not even born in, in all of the Western states or all of the Eastern states. 40% of the people who were, who were working in San, San Jose were born outside the United States. And half of, those, half of the tech companies in Silicon Valley were founded or co-founded by immigrants. You know, people from, from Ireland, people from India, people from China, people from the UK, you know. And it, it became a hub of wealth creation and that we all follow. I mean, we all admire in some way what's, what's the products that have come out of Silicon Valley. And that's what we'd love to have in Ireland. <coughs> A, a place where we, we, can ha we can be a hub uh, for that kind of talent and, and, and we'll, we'll, grow, uh, we'll grow from there. It'll lead, and we know the tech, tech industry is growing and we know that the re and we know that exports of Ireland are growing uh, quarter after quarter. We've got record exports every quarter. So we should, uh, my, my way out of this in terms of recommendations for Ireland and, uh, and our economy is to hook ourselves to the train which has already delivered so much for Ireland to date, which is to recognize that the path that, that Ireland took when, you know, Taoiseach Sean Lamas and T.K. Whitaker, the economist, you know, said, okay, we're not going to be closed off. We're not going to be ourselves alone, just, you know, you know, an isolated country on the fringe of Europe. We're going to be in integral to, the, to Europe. And I, I say with Open Ireland, we're just trying to be integral to the whole world and the whole technology world. And I think that's, a, that's a, a message that will resonate in the world and will send a very clear you know, indication that Ireland is you know, Ireland's open for business and Ireland is thinking differently than any other country in the world. Because right now in Silicon Valley, for example, they're floating a, a ship, Peter Thiel is, is doing a ship, the blue ship, have you heard of this? Uh, 12 miles off in international waters where they could fly a helicopter, you know, to get to the developers that are coming from third world countries, uh, you know, because they can't get the visas to come into Silicon Valley. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Let's, let's take those developers, let's put them in Ireland and generate some fucking awesome companies that, that everybody in the world wants to buy these products from. I've tried that. I've tried that, and I've done that. I would much rather have them right, in, right, right in the same space. You know, has anyone has anyone done this? Has anyone else outsourced to India and or China and and had a shitty experience and and had a you know? Has anyone done this? Yeah, I see a lot of shaking heads. I've spent my both. I've spent my living working as an outsourcer, working on ADOTs. Yeah. I've been in South Africa, and I've been doing work in Ireland, New Zealand. Uh, the same way as I. I'm a former programmer, but a lot of my developers are all over the world. Yeah. And I've had people overwork for me locally. I've had shitty experiences. I've had shitty oh, yeah, experiences. absolutely. No, you can't. It, so it, it really can. depends. Like, I'm always on them, and I do it all the time. Yeah. But if it, you're on it, it can be a very positive experience. And it's also allowed me to bootstrap a startup. Sure. For an end to the price. I'm not. I'm not saying it's not a good idea to do in, in 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 some circumstances. I'm saying it's it's not actually. It's it's better for Ireland's economy to outsource a little bit less. If we can get them in, bring them in. It's better for Ireland's economy. I, I'm being selfish here. I'm saying if, if we want to if we want to not be in a depression for the next 15 years, we better grow our economy. You know. You know. Okay. Sure. We could outsource, and it could be more effective for the startup. But it's also, it's, it, it also can be a very shitty experience as well. It's very inefficient to be traveling back and forth in the eight hour time differences or the six hour time differences. It's not, you know, it's not as good as having the, the talent right here. And if we can, instead of outsourcing, I mean, outsourcing the 500 jobs or the 50 jobs that, you know, that, that all these companies are now, you know, looking overseas to fill, we can fill, fill them here. That's better for Ireland's economy. Now I completely embrace your ethos. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm totally with you. Yeah. Just for, for the individual like that. Yeah. That for, sometimes you get much greater leverage for yeah. the people that you have. And absolutely, of course we're, of course we have to pick and choose, and of course you're, you know, I, you know, you're, you're, you're using these like Elance, great, great site. You know, there's, there's a ton of these great sites. Like if I get one of a, a website prototypes for 500 bucks, I'll, I'll put it up on one of these. This is Chicago based on these. Anyway. There's, there's all sorts of great, uh, you know, great things where you can just turn it over to the community, get it done, get it done quickly, you know, and that's, that's, that's a great, uh, great avenue for a lot of people. And that's efficient uses of the internet. 
But if you're trying to, I'm just, there's other things to look at as well, and this is one of the other things to look at. Okay, well, um, I would just like to wrap up by thanking Sean for coming along, taking time out of his schedule to come with us and to be our first speaker. We could have covered a hell of a lot more ground than we did. Um, Sorry. No, no not that we, um, we're limited in time, but thanks for, uh, for putting me at ease as well. And yeah, great. Really great. Pleasure to do so. yeah, um, great. I just want to give you uh, guys a note on uh, what we're doing next. We, uh, I'll be sending a mail shout out in the next few days, and I just want to highlight a few people that have helped me out. Craig here is on the video. Uh, every startup grind that happens in any city, any meetup gets filmed and puts on, gets put on YouTube. And essentially, uh, Craig has done this for me, and I'm going to send around a mail shot in the next few days with the video. You'll see the quality of the video. I'm also going to put Craig's details on it if you ever need something comparable to that. So, um, big thank you to Craig. Um, second of all, I'd like to announce our next speaker. On the 10th of October, we're going to be talking to Paddy Cosgrave of the Dublin Web Summit and Founders, who's going to talk to us, I suppose, not only about the event that's coming up in October, but what he's done since he started college and the number of different initiatives that he's been involved in. Um, but again, uh, I'd like to thank Sean for coming along. And let's give him a big hand for Darren. Yeah. This is a great idea. It's, really, you know, it's really great to be able to share experiences and for people to bounce off each other in this networking. This is how, how a great and vibrant startup community is created. And Darren, you know, applaud it, Steve. It's really Thank awesome. you very much. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> All right, great. All Thanks right, is that it? Cool. Yeah.